So welcome to this last lecture on gut embryology. This particular session will focus on the hindgut. So we've already gone through the foregut and the midgut and all the associated structures. So if you haven't seen those two videos, I encourage you to look at those first. Now for today's session, we're going to focus on just the hindgut. So this is the, the distal part of the gut tube. And I want you to take away a few things. Firstly, where does it start? Where does it finish? What supplies it from an arterial standpoint? and what drains it from a venous standpoint? How does the cloaca divide? And how that division essentially creates the anal canal and the special relationships, which is important to know clinically. So going across to this picture quickly, we've done this a few times in the gut tube. So you can see the purple tube running throughout, through the, so this is the head end here, and this is the connecting stalk, this is the, ta the tail end, this is the dorsal, this is the ventral. So we've done the gut tube all the way through. We've seen this is the, the four gut structures at the top end, where the demarcation point being essentially part of the duodenum. And then we've gone into the midgut, done the rotations, and now we're ending with the hindgut. So the best way to know where it starts is from the blood supply. So the blood, the aorta that's running on the dorsal aspect of the embryo, we know the foregut is supplied by a branch off the abdominal aorta being the celiac trunk. We know the midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. Now that would lead the hindgut to be supplied by the inferior mesenteric. So the artery supply for all the, the, all the hindgut structures is going to be the inferior mesenteric artery. So that's very easy to remember. And so the best demarcation point between the midgut and the hindgut is where those two arteries, anastomose, or kind of the, the watershed area. And so where that is, so where the start, the start of the hindgut is, is the distal one third of the transverse colon. So we now know that the start of the hindgut is the distal one third of the transverse colon. I'll just put the TC. And so that means all the structures below that is going to be hindgut structures. This is endodermal derivative of the gut tube. So these are going to be the distal, distal one third of the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and then we go into the anal canal. Now the anal canal is, let's break it into thirds. This is the, this is the anus and this is the canal and above that's the rectum. So if we break it into thirds, Essentially, the superior two-thirds will be basically hindgut. So that's going to be endodermal derivatives. And that's important because the blood supply of the superior two-thirds, or the proximal two-thirds, should I say, is going to be the superior rectal artery. And so that's going to be a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery. So to, to recap, the superior two-thirds, or the proximal two-thirds of the anal canal is supplied by the superior rectal artery, which is a uh, derivative from the inferior mesenteric artery, which means that is hindgut. That means the distal one-third or the inferior one-third of the, of the anal canal is going to not be hindgut. So this is going to be ectodermal, okay, which is important to note. Now, just the final point before we go into the cloaca, the only main thing just to be aware of, when your gut tube is so we've got all the mid-gut rotation and the final descending colon will kind of flop to the back wall and where it rests on the back wall, it will kind of be in, encompassed with or um, covered with a bit of peritoneum, which makes it then a secondary retroperitoneal organ. So it kind of becomes retroperitoneal because of that covering of that peritoneum. But it's not a true retroperitoneal organ, let's say, like the kidney. So that's the more higher up structures. But where we focus on now is the, the cloaca. So we can see in these purple structures, which is the gut tube, we can see it kind of coming into this coalescing here, but also we can see structures coming forward in the ventral aspect. And so this ventral part is going to form structures for the urinary system, whereas the di dorsal part is going to be more for the gut. But this collective area is what we call the cloaca. Now, if we zo zoom in and come across here, this is where we can see the cloaca. So we can see the hindgut coming down here, which is endodermal, but we're still purple at this ventral part. So this is also endodermal. 
Now, if you go to the, the, the furthest distal margin, this is the Allen Towers, which will essentially all degenerate here like so and become the uracus, which is then important to become, say, the median umbilical ligament. So this part here will become the urinary bladder and this last part will become the urethra and for the female, the vagina. So to separate this cloaca, we need to put a, sep a septum down in to separate it. So this is what this is going to be here. So this is the blue. And so what's going to happen is this is going to come down and segment it off like so. So this is mesochymal tissue or mesoderm and this is going to segment it off. Now, this is all the blue, all the purple structure is endoderm and we can see this part here, this will be ectoderm, okay? So this is almost like skin and this will be once referred to as the cloacal membrane but as it comes down, it's going to kind of sec section into three parts. The perineum, which is going to be this middle part, the perineal body and then back here, the dorsal part, which is the anal membrane and then forward part, which is going to be for the urethra. So this separation point is important to separate the dorsal um, hindgut, which is going to go out into the rectum to separate the structures of the urinary system, which, as I said, is going to develop the urinary bladder. The allantos would disintegrate to be the uracus and then the ligament and then the urethra and for the female also part of the vagina. So that is important for its separation. Now, there may be some congenital issues there with the separation. So you may have some degrees of fistulas that may form between the rectum and say the vagina and the female or the rectum and the urethra in both sexes. Also, the important point here, as it's coming down, it doesn't actually hit the cloacal membrane or the anal membrane. The septum actually stops there, which you can't really see because I've drawn over. So that would be, let's say, the cloacal membrane. And this is the anorectal septum, which is mesoderm, but it doesn't quite connect. There's a bit of a gap there, which means from the hindgut perspective, the hindgut kind of ends as a blind pouch here so it ends and that means the ectoderm okay has to go up into it and that's going to be the anal pit and that's important because that point where they rejoin is going to be along here okay along that point there so just the important point they they used to think that they joined straight away and that would just create a complete canal but it actually had two blind points and they had to recolonize which means that the anal pit had to grow back up into it and then rejoin so also some congenital problems is you may have atresia which means there are blind pouches there which they don't connect in but the take-home point is where that anal pit which is ectoderm meets the hindgut is essentially the pectinate or the dentate line which is important clinically for a number of reasons, which we're going to go through now. Firstly, the type of cell that's, so this is all ectoderm, the type of cell in this part of the anal canal is going to be stratified squamous, okay? The nerve supply is going to come from the inferior rectal, which is a branch of the pudendal nerve, and that's important because any issue in this area, it will be painful. So you can feel temperature, touch, pain, in this, in, in this area because it's supplied by a somatic nerve or uh, sorry, an afferent which is going to the, um, into the pelvic um, areas which is going to be taken with the inferior rectal nerve S2 to S4 which is part of the pedendal. This is also going to, because it is going to be somatic in origin, it's going to take control of this muscle here which is the external uh, anal sphincter which is voluntary control. And therefore, as we've used in a mnemonic S2, S3, S2, 3, 4 keeps poo off the floor because you have control of this sphincter. Now, above that, so above the pectinate, which, which is going to be hind gut derivatives, we've got two main nerves to be aware of. We've got the pelvic splanchnic, which is parasympathetic, and we've got sympathetic. Sympathetic will essentially innovate the internal um, sphincter which is going to contract it and stop the passing of um, 
feces through, whereas the parasympathetic will supply the mucosa and the internal um, sphincter, which is going to release it and allow you to defecate. In, in terms of a sensory point of view, anything above the pectinate line will, won't have any sensation. So if you were to have cancer above the pectinate line, which is hindgut, it will be painless in its presentation, whereas cancer or tumors below the pectinate line, because it's ectodermal derivative, will be painful. Now, in terms of blood supply, arterially, we've got the superior rectal artery, which we know is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery. So that's um, hindgut derivative. Everything, everything below the pectinate line is going to be inferior rectal artery, which is going to go out of the internal iliac artery. Now, finally, we do the venous drainage above the pectinate line. So the hindgut derivative is going to be drained by the superior rectal vein, which will go into the inferior, I'll write it down, inferior mesenteric vein, which goes with the splenic vein and then go into the portal vein and goes into the liver. So any issue with the liver, and we maybe develop portal hypertension, which will backflow into here like so, which will engorge these vessels, the venous vessels, which can anastomose with the middle and rectal vein, middle rectal vein and the inferior rectal vein, which will also go back um, similar to the, re the rectal artery. This will go back internal iliac vein, internal iliac vein, which is going to the common iliac vein. And so if you have this hypertension, you might have anastomosis here, which causes possibly hemorrhoids. And that's an important presentation with maybe a portal hypertension state. So that's the end of the hindgut. As a take home message, we know that the start of the hindgut is the distal one third of the transverse colon. The, the finish is the proximal two thirds of the anal canal. The arterial supply is the inferior mesenteric artery. The venous drainage is the inferior mesenteric vein. We know a, an important process that happens in the hindgut development around the seven week mark is this septum that grows down in the mesoderm and separates the cloaca. And we know now from this pectinate line that everything below it is ectodermal, everything above it is endodermal. So then we have important things to know about the, the nerve supply, which is done autonomically above and uh, somatically below. And we know that the arterial supply is gonna be inferior from the superior rectal artery and the inferior is below going into the systemic circulation and the venous drainage is going to be inferior mesenteric artery which is a superior rectal vein and these middle and inferior is going back into the common iliac vein. So hopefully this video has helped you understand hindgut embryology.